This is Greg Lois, and today I'm going to be talking about coronavirus, COVID-19, and workers' compensation claims in New York. I hope everyone is well and enjoying their uh, involuntary house arrest that they're under. I had a great weekend uh, hanging out with my kids, watching them do all sorts of crazy creative endeavors, including making forts in the basement and all that kinds of stuff. So I hope everyone had fun over the weekend. I hope no one is affected by this. I hope everyone's healthy. Uh, so far, it just seems like a big nothing burger in terms of uh, the actual illnesses, although a lot of people are testing positive, uh, but so far, so good. All right, let's talk uh, a little bit of what we're going to discuss today. We're going to talk about the coronavirus and its impact on workers' compensation and also employment in New York in a more general sense. I'm going to talk about uh, what's compensable, what's not. I'm going to talk about the jurisdictional standards of proof. I'm going to walk through some case-by-case -case analysis. I'm going to give you the benefit of the prior case law and prior infections and illnesses in this state. I'm going to answer as many of the common questions as I can during the course of the webinar, but this is completely live, so I am asking uh, that you type in your questions to me while I speak, and I will answer as many questions live as I can. During the course of the webinar, we're going to talk about specific work situations and how your investigation should be conducted. And again, I want to spend the majority of this time we have together answering your questions live. I've been answering uh, sort of the, a lot of the same repetitive questions for a lot of different clients over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I hope the handout is useful, but I also think it's useful to stick around to the end when I answer the questions and hear what kind of questions uh, maybe some of your colleagues are asking and see what sort of answers we're giving them. All right. Uh, first, where we are today, let's talk about New York in general. First of all, my firm, 100% open. I have 52 employees. Currently, 48 of them are working remotely uh, from home. There should be absolutely no interruption of our service to you. I have a few essential staff here in the office with me, just making sure the mail comes in and goes out, that kind of stuff. Uh, but in general, we should be 100% available to you. You should see no interruption. Uh, that's not true about most businesses in the state of New York. The governor has closed uh, most businesses saying that they're non-essential and uh, uh, demanding that 75% of employees work from home where they can. Uh, of course, uh, whether that ends up ever being constitutional out will be determined, I guess, shortly or as this thing drags on. Anyway, um, some civil quarantines have been implemented in New York. Uh, there is an entire uh, municipality in New York, uh, the city of uh, Rochelle, New Rochelle, which has been literally quarantined and closed, surrounded by National Guard. Uh, but as far as uh, other quarantines, there have been no other, uh, to our knowledge, workplace or uh, political subdivision quarantines. There have been something they're calling a self-quarantine or isolation. Uh, again, these are self-quarantines. So they're telling someone, hey, you've been exposed, go home and self-quarantine. Uh, it's a bit of an oxymoron. I don't know what, it's like going to self-jail, like there's nobody keeping you in your home. Uh, we are not doing anything like what they did in China where they're actually nailing people's doors shut when they're under quarantine. So the word quarantine has been sort of misused or mis, uh, 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 misapplied in a lot of ways. But I'm gonna talk about who is really quarantined, who's not, and what these different statements mean. What is a business closure versus a quarantine, for example? Next, uh, workers' compensation courts continue to hold hearings. Everything is going on virtually and remotely. Workers' Compensation Board in New York had some trouble last week uh, with their main email address where uh, documents get filed, not working for some small period of time. They seem to have worked that out. And it looks like workers' compensation courts continue uh, without uh, any hiccups in general. However, the civil courts are all closed, no jury trials, very limited criminal or family law proceedings are going on. In general, the civil courts are closed. All right, this is a live question and answer uh, webinar. Uh, the way you ask questions is you type them in. I will not say your full name. I'll just say your first name. I'll repeat your question so the whole audience has the benefit of the question, and then I will dive into answering as many questions as I possibly can. I really think it's important because a lot of people are asking the same questions, and so useful to just sort of hear what I'm answering to other people it might help. Um, next. Uh, if you don't have a copy of our New York, New Jersey, Longshore, or Dual Jurisdiction Defense Handbook, that's our construction uh, law handbook, please let me know. I'll get one right in the mail to you, or I'll send you a link for an instant download. I also put the links in today's handouts. Our new monthly schedule of webinars, we do um, webinars every Monday. Uh, the first Monday of the month is our Dual Jurisdiction Construction Claims webinar. Second Monday of the month is our uh, Risk Transfer webinar. 
Third Monday of the month is our New, our New York webinar, excuse me, and our last Monday of the month is our New York Workers' Compensation webinar. So join us for those. Uh, they're always fast paced, they're always live, and we answer all your questions during those. All right, let's talk a little background about COVID-19 in general. I'm gonna presume uh, everyone here has been watching their news channel of choice and has gotten tons of conflicting and confusing information about COVID-19. Uh, I can tell you boots on the ground, it is like a ghost town. Uh, normally for me to get to my office, uh, I could take anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes sometimes it's taking like five minutes because there's literally nobody on the roads people are uh, being uh, very obedient to the civil authorities and really are uh, sort of self-isolating or put placing themselves essentially under house arrest so that people seem to be obeying of course uh, none of the outbreak that maybe is being reported is visual you can't see any of this it's not like there's big lines outside hospitals there's nobody screaming nobody's house is on fire it just looks kind of like a ghost town uh it is also snowing today in new york which also is sort of adding to the quiet factor all right now I just wanna say in general, prophylactic or safety measures are not covered by workers' compensation. And that would be uh, an employer prophylactically closing, just saying, you know what, I think we should be closed because there's this general flu thing going around. I don't wanna be open. That's a, that's a really, that's a precaution. Uh, that's not medical treatment and that's not a response to an outbreak or an illness. That's just precautionary stuff. Not compensable, does not trigger exposure under your workers' compensation policy. And really from a workers' compensation perspective, where an employer is closed, and whether that's by executive order or the employer just saying, you know, I want to send everybody home, doesn't matter. It doesn't trigger a workers' compensation exposure. And I want to give two analogies because I think they're useful analogies. An employer comes to you and says, I've installed an eyewash station last month uh, because, you know, we deal with chemicals here in the employment, and I want to make sure that if anybody gets injured due to these chemicals, they have an eyewash station. Uh, now, workers' comp policy, pay me out for that eyewash station. No you know, a protective measure or safety devices that you're putting into the workplace, those don't trigger any exposure under our workers' compensation coverage, and we all feel very comfortable understanding that. Or how about an industrial uh, setting that says, you know what, Greg, uh, we just put in uh, this uh, dust mitigation system so that our employees don't have to inhale all this dust. That's great. Thank you. The health and well-being of your employees is paramount. I'm glad you're taking care of them but it doesn't mean that your workers' compensation carrier covers it. And so for all the employers who are sending their employees home uh, as a precautionary measure or prophylactic measure, that does not trigger workers' compensation coverage, and that does not trigger any exposure for us as carriers or employers. And I want us to be extremely clear about that. Next, uh, the word quarantine gets thrown around a lot, uh, but no one's been placed under quarantine. Very rare that uh, individuals are given quarantines. But businesses have not been issued quarantines. It's a very specific thing. It's really where a medical authority or a civil authority says you're quarantined due to illness, and here are the restrictions you currently have. Uh, so far in New York, there's been one municipality, and there have been individuals who have been instructed to be quarantined by medical professionals, but not entire businesses or industries. And when the governor issues was this very silly-hearted uh, close every business uh, uh, recommendation that he's issued, uh, again, constitutionally, of that, I'll hold that off to the side, uh, that's not a quarantine. And that is not the same thing as a quarantine, even though on the government's own website, they seem to use all these terms intermittently. Next. Jurisdictional standards of proof have not changed, uh, and there are plenty of cases and case law going back 100 years in New York on infectious disease and illnesses in the workplace and when they are and are not compensable. So I'm going to go through some of that case law with you today. Testing for a condition is not treatment. Let me repeat that again. Testing, diagnostics, finding out, these, this is not treatment. It does not trigger exposure under workers' compensation coverage. I had one employer that I met with over the weekend ask me, Greg, before people come into work on Monday morning, we want to take all of their temperatures. And if anybody has a fever, I want to send them home because I don't want anybody here with a fever, even if it's COVID-19 or not. I just don't want them here infecting everyone else. I said, great. Why are you calling me? Because that does not trigger any exposure or any uh, have any issue with your workers' compensation policy. Remember, any prophylactic or protective measure you put in place uh, does not uh, trigger workers' comp coverage. It's only if after you do all of this testing, you discover, oh, by the way, these people have this condition, and then they allege that it's causally related to the employment, and then they get past the jurisdictional standard of proof that we'll talk about next, where you might be responsible for that. So again, uh, safety measures, precautions, those types of things are not compensable. Testing is in general not gonna be compensable. There's gonna be one small exception to that. Let me continue. 
workers, or, I'm sorry, employment uh, closures due to executive orders is not a quarantine. It's just simply not a quarantine. And I know uh, as I've gotten, I uh, had phone calls with clients over the last couple of weeks, I've heard many, many times the statement of, Greg, the employer's under a quarantine. They're under a quarantine. Do I have to pay coverage? Do I have to pay temporary disability? Greg, they're under a quarantine. I say, they're not under a quarantine. They're under a work closure by executive order. They have not been quarantined. Quarantine is something very specific. There's been isolated individual quarantines. And that's where they say, literally, you've been exposed because uh, you've exchanged fluids with somebody in, in this either workplace or in your home. Uh, now you have to self-isolate. That's very different than an employer being issued a quarantine notice, and that has not happened to the best of my knowledge. Um, work closures, particularly by uh, 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 governmental order, civil authority order, and then followed up or voluntary by the uh, employer will be the basis for unemployment claims, not workers' compensation claims. And I do want to talk a little bit about the benefits that are going to be available to sick people uh, and even sick workers. Uh, because I really do not believe that in the majority of them are going to be able to obtain a workers' compensation benefit. Uh, quarantine may be a basis for paid sick leave and family leave insurance claims, but not for workers' compensation claims. So let's walk through uh, what sick workers' benefits will be entitled to. Again, I do not believe in most cases uh, that they are going to be entitled to workers' compensation. So under New York sick leave law, between five and 14 days of paid time off for employee sick leave is required by statute. That is going to be, uh, that was mandatory by the way, as of March 17th, 2020. And for most people, if they truly are ill, and again, it's not work related, you just got ill because of your general exposure to the general population, you're gonna take your paid sick time. Now, if you look at those times of paid sick time, which starts at five days for the smallest employers and up to 14 days uh, for the largest employers of paid sick time, you realize, well, 99 plus percent of these COVID-19 cases are resolving in under two weeks, which means most people who have the condition and couldn't work simply because of the condition would be paid their sick time and then return to work. Now, the work may be closure, closed, uh, now, if it, their sickness was to continue to become permanent or to have uh, additional effects, then they would qualify for temporary disability. And that would be the two sources of benefits, paid sick leave, transitioning to temporary disability, which would pay a benefit for up to uh, uh, two, uh, six months, excuse me. Now, the maximum benefit for temporary disability in New York is currently $840 and change. You'll note that's about $100 less a week than the current maximum benefit for workers' compensation, which is $934 and some change. So you can see where people would definitely rather get workers' compensation than be on temporary disability. But the vast majority of people, and basically everyone who doesn't qualify for workers' comp, will be able to use their paid sick leave and then go on temporary disability. Next. Uh, where they don't have temporary disability benefit or uh, where it's not them that's ill, but a member of their family, they can go on family leave insurance, which will also pay a benefit of $840 and some change per week. So uh, that's these uh, sick, truly sick employees are, are going to be protected either by paid sick leaves for a short period of time and then either temporary disability or family leave insurance. What about not sick people? Not sick people, uh, but their work is closed due to the governor's uh, my believe extra constitutional order. Uh, they'll, again, be able to use their earned sick leave. In fact, the statute says they can. Their, their work's been closed. And that's it. Um, there, there, there are other types of relief, and I know there's a presidential bill that's coming allegedly, uh, but that's what they're going to be entitled to. They are not placed under quarantine, which means it's not going to trigger, trigger uh, a benefit under family leave insurance. Now, they can claim that someone else in their family that they care for uh, is uh, sick or ill and they have to take care of them, and that would then trigger their family leave insurance benefit. But in general, this is the at-risk population, people who's got work closed, they're not sick, uh, they're allowed to use some sick time, but that's their benefit. What about people who are not sick, but work has voluntarily closed? Um, well, bad news for you guys. When you're voluntarily closing your business, uh, you've been laid off. So those claimants are going to be, or those unsick, healthy workers are going to be entitled to unemployment benefits. They should probably be applying for that now. All right, that pretty much covers uh, the majority of the benefits flow that's gonna be available to workers who are not working due, at this time due to these conditions. Let's talk about those who are gonna claim workers' compensation. They're gonna say, uh, either I was injured uh, because of a traumatic uh, incident, a discrete incident leading to my infection or illness, or because of my exposure in general in the workplace. 
two very different standards of proof that we're going to have to use to analyze those claims, and let's talk about them now. First of all, what is a traumatic claim? Well, it's really a very specific uh, discrete incident which leads to a very specific infection, illness, or exposure. This is someone saying, I came into contact with the blood bodily fluids uh, expectorant or uh, coughing of someone who was infected with COVID-19, and I immediately fell ill or infected. Uh, they're going to have to be, say that this was the very specific discrete exposure. It was my only exposure, and that's how I contracted this illness. Very difficult to meet this uh, standard. Now, first responders are uh, have a lower standard of proof, and there is a presumption that it would be compensable if there has been a specific documented exposure. So a first responder who says, I was loading a sick uh, COVID-19 patient into an ambulance. Uh, they, I exchanged bodily fluids. They coughed right in my face. The sputum hit my face. Uh, that type of thing. Those are going to be presumed to be compensable. But that's a very small subset of the population. We're going to fall into that first responders. Those first responders are also allowed to have presumptive testing. If they can claim that they had any type of exposure under Section 10.3, uh, their their testing will also be uh, compensable. Um, now. There is tons of case law in New York. New York's got a very old workers' compensation law passed in 1911. So we've got over 100 years of case law on the interpretation of when an infectious illness or disease is compensable. And when you look at that vast body of case law involving discrete, specific incidents, it, the burden is always on the claimant to show a very specific exposure leading to a very specific causally related condition. Uh, I really haven't come across any case, and, and by the way, New York's got cases on hepatitis B, AIDS, uh, herpes, every type of infectious disease, like tuberculosis that you could imagine, and very similar ones, respiratory injuries, uh, illnesses. I think tuberculosis is a very close um, uh, corollary. Uh, measles case, smallpox cases. I mean, a lot of these cases throughout New York's history, and in every one of them, the burdens always fall on the claim to show that specific discrete exposure and immediate condition causally related. So we're going to rely on that. When we're disputing or defending these cases, we should be defending them and denying the vast majority of them. The burden is on the claimant to show how they were injured, and most of them are not going to be able to meet that, uh, that, uh, that threshold. The next type or classification of injuries are those that are going to be these occupational exposure claims, right? What is an exposure claim? It's someone who says that their uh, conditions of the employment cause them to develop a very distinct condition or disease. Now, New York's uh, jurisdictional standard is very specific. It says, quote, when the result of a distinctive feature of the kind of work and not an ailment caused by a peculiar place or caused by ordinary contact with a fellow employee, close quote. And what does that really mean? It means the type of injury that the claimant has to allege has to be only present, peculiar to, distinct to, unique to that particular workplace. And there is a ton of case law over the last 100 years interpreting this. And the case law has specifically said things like general conditions, hot, cold, uh, variations in temperature, uh, uh, exposure to co-employees who may be sick or ill with communicable diseases. None of that stuff's unique to any one employment. Every employment really has some exposure to hot, cold, changes in temperature, and other people. And for that reason, these are consistently held not compensable in New York. So uh, there are some rare exceptions where infectious diseases have been held compensable uh, in the, uh, the, the context of occupational exposure. But in general, the burden has to be very high for the petitioner to meet this, or sorry, the claimant to meet this. And in particular, simply saying things like, well, I'm a medical professional, I'm exposed to things, is not good enough. So those of you who have asked me questions about uh, your nurses and your visiting home nurses who are saying things like, well, I'm, in, I'm exposed to these things, and so I, I have a higher chance. Well, it's true that they are exposed to these things, but really any more than anybody else, any member of a general public, are they really exposed more than the checkout person at the grocery store line? The answer is no. And there's nothing distinctive, there's no specific feature of their employment that's going to lead them to uh, find these compensable. Now, the, the exception to that, or you know, the exception within the rule, is if someone says, well, look, I look, I work on the COVID-19 floor of the respiratory floor of the hospital. You know, I'm in the respiratory ring. This is all I'm dealing with every day for the last two months, and I've contracted COVID-19. All right, that might be compensable because there is something extremely distinctive, unique, and peculiar to that specific employment that exposes them to that specific illness, and that could be compensable. 
So I think that that's going to be your one ex uh, exception. The other exception, of course, is public safety workers. Public safety workers means firefighter, emergency medical technician, police officer, correction officer, someone who works in the Department of Corrections, uh, someone who supervises or maintains uh, 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 any kind of medical facilities that are uh, responding to a catastrophic event. In general, they are allowed presumptive testing. If they claim uh, that they uh, uh, were exposed to something, then uh, we do have a presumptive duty to provide them with diagnostic testing. And we have to uh, presume as well that if the testing demonstrates that uh, that they were exposed to something and have contracted that communicable disease, that that would then be compensable as well. Again, that's going to apply to a very small subset of the general claim population. All right. When claims are made in New York, I want to stress that most claims are not going to be compensable. Our standing position for most traumatic injuries should be denial and putting the claimant to their proofs. Our standing position for most occupational exposure claims in which they are alleging uh, that they caught it from, perhaps from a coworker, et cetera, should be an outright controversy and denial every single time. Uh, we should be filing our Freud-04, our first report of injury denial type should be filed. Once the board indexes those, uh, we should also be filing our pre-hearing conference statement and demonstrating that we're ready to put the claimant to their proofs in all respects. Um, I recommend strongly that in nearly all of these cases, uh, with very rare exception, we put the claimant to their proofs, we demand all discovery, and we hold their feet to the fire on these because uh, if these things do become very widespread and we start to see a lot of these claims, uh, it's going to be nearly impossible uh, for the claimants to prevail. So let's let's make sure we definitely uh, raise all of our defenses. It's going to be important uh, when you all, when claims do come in first that the employer contact you as promptly as they can. Let's get some employer contacts in place. Let's find out if there's other uh, clusters of these claims in that workplace. Let's determine exactly the best we can anything distinctive or unique about that workplace that would heighten their exposure. We're not going to uh, expect that most workplaces are going to uh, trigger this heightened exposure. All right. Uh, I've been talking a lot. Let's jump into a live question and answer. If you haven't typed in your question yet, type your question in now so that I can answer it. Uh, this, no question is silly because I think we all uh, ask questions and, and sort of want to get the benefit of what everybody's thinking here. So uh, let's uh, please contribute to this conversation by asking questions. I see I've got a bunch. All right, I've got a couple people saying uh, the handout isn't working. Handout isn't working. Eric, Monty, Jennifer, I can't, you're not being able to download the handout. I have a problem here too, by the way. Our corporate firewall doesn't allow us to download things from outside. So even in our test uh, room here at the production center, we can't uh, download it. I will email it to you. No worries. I see your messages. All right. Uh, next. Can you discuss IME appointments that may be impacted? Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, may be impacted by the doctor's inability uh, or inavailability to make an appointment. Okay, so the board, that's Leonard's question, um, or need for a translator or patient unavailability or inability to make an appointment. All right, so let me go grab my visual aid. Uh, New York has issued a bulletin saying, hey, look, we understand that these um, uh, situations are going to be screwing up two things. One is the 90-day requirement for medical evidence. They have relaxed essentially that 90-day requirement for medical evidence. And they have said that where the claimant alleges that they can't uh, go to the doctor because of COVID-19, uh, and you're impacting the doctor, the doctors are not taking the emergent, uh, uh, non-emergent patients right now, the board's relaxing that 90-day requirement for claimants, as well as on the issues of IMEs. If we can argue look, we couldn't schedule the IME, the doctor was not accepting uh, non-emergent patients, the doctor would not um, evaluate them, uh, that's going to be a valid reason for us to push and move those IMEs. Of course, this is going to really impact and challenge our ability to get these cases to maximum medical improvement and move them on to permanency because we're not going to be able to get some of these IME reports. In terms of depositions, we have seen uh, some of our doctors canceling the depositions saying they're not going to appear. Uh, I don't understand why you would cancel a video or a phone deposition at this point, but that is happening. And so that's something that is starting to come about. All right. Uh, Leonard, uh, Leonard asked the question, what about psych claims? Could the stress of quarantine job stoppage qualify as mental stress beyond the usual and customary stress in the workplace? No, sorry. Uh, there's uh, tons of case law in New York saying simple stress from think you're going to lose your job 
or the, the place is going to close. Those That stress is not unique or peculiar to any one workplace. And hey, by the way, this new, this new everybody's under house arrest rule, everybody would have a stress claim. I have a stress claim because I want to know, hey, when do we go back to normal? No one's telling us when these uh, restrictions sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, get lifted. But uh, no, that is not going to be the valid basis for a stress claim in New York. There's nothing peculiar, distinct, extraordinary to one person, uh, and there's nothing specific to any employment. And so if you do get a psych claim for this or stress claim uh, or post-traumatic stress disorder claim, someone thinks they got COVID-19, but they didn't, uh, those are all going to fail and those should all be denied. All right, Mark asked the question, what about bus drivers? Right, so those, uh, there are so many employments, uh, Mark, where people are exposed uh, to the general public. And when I say exposed to the general public, I mean, I'm trying to think of something where you're more exposed than public transportation, uh, grocery store clerk. I know the liquor stores by me are running low because everybody's in and out of the stores right now, buying everything they possibly can. Uh, yeah, all those people are going to be exposed to the general public. Nothing unique about those employments uh, that is going to lend them to be more or less compensable than any other claim. I would argue that any public uh, uh, transportation claims should be disputed or denied. Uh, Amanda asked the question, do you think the board will uphold payment suspensions for not having updated medical during this unique time? No, I do not. Uh, the board has specifically said that the claimant's 90-day requirement for up-to-date medical uh, will be uh, uh, viewed in the light most favorable to the claimant. And the light most favorable to the claimant is going to be that they couldn't get there because the doctor wouldn't see them or the doctor is not accepting non-emergent patients. So no, I don't think it's going to uh, work. Sorry. Uh, Kurt, how are claims for social workers handled? They work a lot of homeless and people that may be high risk. Sure. Again, uh, I don't think that they're going to have any higher presumption of compensability than anybody else. They're going to have to show a very distinct vector. They're going to have to say, this person uh, was infected and specifically infected me, and here's how it happened. They're going to have to point to a specific discrete event. Other than that, if they just claim, well, I work with them, they're around me, uh, I have this exposure claim, I think most of those are going to fail, and I think most of those should be disputed. Okay, Amy asked me a very specific question about the New York State Disability Max uh, Disability Law Maximum, uh, and I'll answer that uh, offline because I just don't know the um, actual statutory payment requirements right now off the top of my head. And one other question here: Is anybody got anything else? All right, we're looking pretty good. Um, Karen asked the question. This is a great one. What will claimants be given extended time? to submit proof of labor market attachment. Yeah, I don't think a labor market attachment claim uh, defense is gonna be very useful right now saying, hey, this person uh, has a partial temporary disability and they have a duty to go out there and look for work within their restrictions. That's what we're arguing when we're raising a labor market attachment defense. Uh, it should be a valid defense, but really if the governor is closing all employment and saying that everybody's gotta work from home, really practically, that defense is not going to have much teeth because the claim is just going to, have to come forward and say, yeah, uh, while the entire uh, state was shut down, I was looking for a job, but I couldn't find a job within my restrictions during that period of time. And I would expect a law judge to give them a lot of leeway uh, and find that very persuasive. All right, Marguerite asked the question, what about employees traveling for business? Yeah, so uh, I think this has come up a couple times. I've had a couple questions about employees who have to travel. A lot of employers have put travel restrictions in places saying, hey, we're not going to conferences. We're not going to these events. You're not going to go visit your clients uh, because we don't want you uh, ex enhancing or expo your exposure. Uh, for those reasons, uh, in general, where the employer believes that they're sending somebody into a, a, a location where there might be a higher than normal risk, uh, I still don't think that those are going to be more uh, compensable than not, but they're going to be really hard to defend against when the employee comes back and says, well, there was nobody there, but uh, or not that there was nobody there, there's, you know, uh, I'm providing notice to you, I'm now ill, I was traveling, you required me to travel, they're gonna be harder to defend because there's just gonna be more variables, but I still think your default position on a travel claim would be to dispute, deny, and controvert that claim. All right, hope that's useful to everybody. Um, I don't know why that just slipped over there. Maybe I disconnected something, but okay. Um, 
All right, let me go back to this. If you have further questions or stuff that's not covered by the handout, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I did put my cell phone number in that handout, so I did get a lot of calls over the weekend. I'm always happy to answer those. In the meantime, if you don't have a copy of one of our handbooks, please let me know and I'll get one right out to you or send you an instant download. Uh, in two weeks, our next webinar is on risk transfer and dual jurisdiction claims, construction claims. Please join us for that. And I'll see you until next time. Hope everybody stays well.